Hey everyone, I have a really exciting show for you today. Uh, I get a lot of folks that reach out to me and say, hey, can I get 30 minutes of your time? I'm a new investor. And frankly, those are hard for me to say yes to, uh, but I was able to work with this guest and uh, we're gonna go through a half hour or 45 minutes of questions. So why don't we welcome Charles Pridgen to the show. How are you doing this morning, Charles? I'm doing well, Michael. Thank you very much. Excellent. So as, as the opening says, you're a new investor. We have some of the, we, we, we kind of knew of each other because we have some similar friends, uh, but you and I have never spoken uh, until this morning and uh, no setups, no, no, no material given. We're going to do this cold. And uh, so first introduce yeah. the world to who, who is Charles, where you're at, what, where, where you are in your life of investing and we'll go from yeah. there. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. Huge fan of yours. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've recently uh, relocated to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, by way of San Francisco. Um, I, uh, from a career perspective, I, I work in tech, right? Um, my family, or I originally grew up in Maryland, and uh, moved to San Francisco or California to pursue a, a career in technology. Um, you know, fast forward, had a you know, a lot of success working for various tech companies in the Bay Area. Um, and then I was provided the wonderful opportunity to uh, open our office here in Atlanta. Um, you know, for me, a huge priority was being closer to my, my family, uh, my niece and my nephew. Um, you know, as I'm 32 years old, and for me, you know, real estate investment, after doing a lot of research, was, you know, one of the main vehicles for, for driving wealth. And uh, as I look, you know, get a little older, you know, now starting to think about my future, my retirement, um, this is one of the vehicles that I developed a strong interest in learning more about. Um, and that brings me to why we're, we're talking today. Um, my first time, you know, real estate investor or aspiring real estate investor. Um, and there's a lot of information out there. And so yeah. I'm hoping through our conversation today, uh, I'll be able to leave with some, you know, nuggets and really good information on, you know, practical next steps I might get started. Yeah, I, well, it's hard to predict the future, but I feel pretty good about saying we're we're gonna do we're gonna do okay both for you and the audience. Uh, let's just make it uh, one of the reasons that uh, I said yes to this because again I get a lot of questions is uh, your background right where you are now is kind of where I was when I started right. We were both tech workers, we were wow. both in sales, um, we were both in positions where we have on target earnings of X. And if you do really well, you can make X squared. Um, so I, I have a particular, I don't know, kinship with you because I know if you bust your tail during the day, you can earn a fair living, save, and then invest. And then that investment will change your life. So, um, it was a very easy yes answer. Cause I know that if we just set you on the right path, uh, and others watching this, uh, okay. we, we can make a big difference. So, uh, yeah, but Mike, when, when you were in my shoes, curious, what was it, or was it one person that, that sparked your interest to go in this direction? Uh, uh well, it, well, it's kind of, uh, kind of two part answer. First for me, it starts with a failure. Um, you got to remember when I was your age, it was coming right out of the dot com era. Yeah. And there was a time where anybody and their brother could make money day trading stocks, right? I was day trading Cisco systems at the time and one other that now escapes me. And no, I, I recorded six figure profits on my tax return. Wow. And, um, you know, you feel like Warren Buffett. And then yeah. suddenly out of nowhere, that doesn't work. And now you're writing off six figures a year. And, you know, you were once, a genius and now you're you're the fool so um, my first mistake is uh, and I've never been back I'm not a stock person so I, I went from the ultimate highs down to um, you know nearly nothing left it was all wiped out so then I go to a bookstore because uh, I'm your age technically a little a little younger I was 30 uh, and I went uh, searching for help because I grew up in a situation where money was always a stressor uh, it wasn't very prevalent, and I just didn't want that for my family, which was, uh, we, we had a daughter, I think she was eight or nine at the time, and I just didn't want that. Uh, and I found real estate, and most specifically, Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, was a book that kind of shook me to my core. Uh, it's the only book I've read cover to cover five times in a row, uh, and each time something else 
felt like slapped me in the face. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Robert Kiyosaki uh, and also not being Warren Buffett were the two things that kind of shook me when yeah. I was your age. Awesome. I'm taking some notes here. Mm -hmm. Got so okay. So fast forward, you know, you you you, you know go through the, the dot com bubble, and, and you're now looking for other you know opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. What was it about real estate that really you know sparked your interest, or like really? It was really that story about Kim Kiyosaki, and I remember it still talking about a condo. I think it was in Portland where she was making fifty dollars a month. Well, and I was like, oh, I can do that. And oh, by the way, most importantly to me is I felt, and now I had no reason to believe this at the time, but I just felt to my core, I could do this while dominating in my day job, right? I'm not one of those individuals that say, quit your day job, go full time, magic happens and, you know, hallelujah. That's not me. I see that ending badly for most people. I wanted to crush my day job, work as hard as humanly possible from seven to seven, and then add one rental at a time, hence the name of my book, uh, at going forward. And, and, and we did that, right? We added, we got to eight properties right near the peak, and it, it started just one at a time. One the first year, I think we did two the next year, and two the year after. Um, it was just that simple, is I could see a way to stack chips. And ultimately, I believed uh, that that would lead to financial freedom. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. So, so I guess taking a step back, with that being said, um, you're, you're a first time you know, real estate investor. Um, you know, looking back, what are some of the, you know, the, the common mistakes that you experienced or that you've seen in you know, first time investors that you would you know, now looking back kind of advise uh, new investors to, to look out for? Yeah, so I, can, I answer that question best when you appreciate my lens, right? I was a full-time employee who worked no less than 60 hours a week, traveled all over the world, right? So that's my lens. Um, so the first answer is too many new investors get um, distracted by what I call shiny objects, right? Oh, I'm going to be a wholesaler. I'm going to do direct mail. I'm going to buy notes. I'm going to buy tax deeds. I'm going to buy multifamily. I'm going to buy single family homes. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So you end up taking one inch progress on 12 different paths and you get nowhere. Um, I'm not great at lots of things, but one thing I'm very, very good at is when I make a decision, I go all in, right? For me, it's either black or white, right? It's, it's like, like if you're playing craps, I pick a number, right? I don't pick red or black, right? I'm like, I want 17, right? That's, I'm all in. Um, yeah. So I was going to be a buy and hold long-term landlord. So that's, that's, I don't know, mistake number one is too many things. Pick your lane. And if you don't know what your lane is, that's okay. Spend the time figuring out what fits you. I would tell you as a sales professional in technology, you're going to need something that you can work off hours and you don't, you don't get those phone calls or you don't have to react to a marketing campaign or something, right? So your, your options are limited and buy and hold is probably the right answer. But again, for you and for others watching this to decide. So if you don't know, figure it out, but then pick your lane. And why I say that is real estate investing offers so many things, but you only have to be good at one to be financially free. You don't have to do 17 different things right? Max Maxwell got successful wholesaling houses. Now, yes, he does more, but that's, he, he, he didn't go 17 different directions. Mike Zuber got financially free because of buy and hold real estate. He didn't, he didn't try to be Max Maxwell and do wholesaling and all. No, right? I had a day job. I had little slivers of time and I, I picked what worked. So that's the first one. The second one is um, most new investors want it fast. Even if you're a buy and hold investor and you follow me and I say think in decades, they want it fast. So they do, you know, depending if I'm being nice or mean, I could say risky or stupid things, right? Depending on what kind of mood I'm in. <laughs> and what I mean by that is they could over leverage, right? I got an email the other day about, hey, what do you think about doing 90 or 100% loans? I'm like, are you, have you not read my book? The, the first logo I created was no alligators. You don't want an asset that consumes month, i.e. negative cash flow, right? You don't want to have to take part of your commission check or your base salary and feed this asset because you're betting on appreciation. 
I don't yeah. use appreciation in any of my calculations. Yes, it happens. And if I ever sell or 1031, great. Um, but, but, but stop it, right? Oh, and, and they always come back with, well, I only have X amount of dollars. Well, start living below your means, right? Start saving money. Get a second job. I, I don't know what the answer is for people, but yeah. spend less money. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. I tell it all the time. In fact, I just did a video on this. The hardest part about financial freedom is sacrifice, and it's long-term sacrifice. We had 10-year-old cars. We lived in the same condominium with the same base vanilla white kitchen for 15 years. We didn't go on vacations. We took our spending from 100% to 50% of our income, right? Most people don't want to hear that because it's hard. It's uncomfortable. Uh, and I remember an emotional time coming back from like the 17th housewarming party, right? Because when you start this at 30 and then you're 40, right? People are buying bigger homes and they got multiple new cars and you're still driving up in the same beat up Ford or whatever it was. And um, that's emotional, right? Uh, and thank yeah. God social media wasn't around back then because we'd be the most boring people ever. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's just the honest truth. People, people don't want to hear that. And, but I'm here to tell you, if you're willing to sacrifice, I think most people can do it in 10 years. Uh, it took us 15, right? We live in the Bay Area, which is ridiculously expensive. So it took us longer, uh, but it's absolutely possible. Um, yeah, so those, those are some of the things that I see. Yeah, great. No, thank you for that. And just taking a step back to your first point, I really like that, that note, uh, finding your lane, right? Mm -hmm. And I think as a first time real estate investor, that's I think one of the hardest uh, kind of, you know, decisions to make or, uh, you know, deciding factors of like, you know, which direction do I go in? Um, you know, with that being said, could you just give maybe an overview of how you came to the idea of the buying hold strategy working best for you? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so again, I think that's a great question because um, I looked at that differently than most people. I think most people in my shoes look at the upside or the check, right? How can I get, they think about the rewards and that's not how my brain works. For whatever reason, it's probably because of my sales career. Um, I knew that it wasn't the rewards I should look at because that probably would have brought a different answer. It was, I have constraints. And for me, my biggest constraint was time. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to work seven to seven, five days a week, and probably be on an airplane Sunday night to some other part of the world, I have, I have very little time. And oh, by the way, I have a family, right? It's not like I'm a bachelor. So yeah. what, what can I do in 15 or 20 minute increments every day and make a difference in my financial future? And what that came down to me was I could find deals right? Find things to buy and I can secure capital, right? That means earn commissions, right? Earn, earn, a, earn a living and save money. That's the only things I could do. I couldn't property manage. I couldn't be a general contractor. I couldn't pink paint colors for heaven's sakes. I couldn't do a marketing campaign. I couldn't do lead follow-up. I mean, not, nothing else with a 15 to 20 minute blocks every day I could do. Just there was nothing else. So I looked at my constraints. I looked myself in the mirror. I realized that there were other ways to make big chunks of money. But again, I am not the person that says, quit your job, right? I grew up in a family where uh, there were many times uh, the, main bread, the main bread winner was unemployed. And yes, they were trying to do things. But as a kid growing up in that situation, I was never going to do that to my family, right? I was never going to have my daughter or wife go, do we, do we pay the electricity or go buy food? Um, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, for me, it was about evaluating your constraints. I figured out mine was time. And I said, well, okay, what's the maximum benefit? And for me, it was under, finding deals. That's the number one thing I did. I looked every day for greater than 10 years. And that's what I teach people today. Most people go, well, how do I do that? Well, I go, well, good news. Uh, after I retired, I created a course to help you do that. And I, give it, <laughs> I, I sell it for nearly nothing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's what I did. And, and that's what fit me. And it, it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Th thanks again for that. So, mm -hmm. so when you look at your overall um, investment strategy, um, mm -hmm. you, know, or, you know, for me specifically, it's, it's, 
you know, do I look at the uh, vacation rental? Do I look at the um, single family house? Do I look at the multifamily unit? Mm -hmm. um, do I even look at possibly pulling together funds from friends and family members for a local commercial space, right? <laughs> Um, you know, how do you make, a, you know, how would you, in, you know, advise someone like myself? Oh, I love this question. This goes back to one kind of similar to what we did just talked about real, real estate investors get distracted by these shiny objects. Yeah. So there are a couple of things that you mentioned. One syndication is really, really big pooling capital from other people. Yep. Next bigger is better. Thanks to good old Grant Cardone. Um, I've been doing this a long time. And I could tell you, at least in my market today, bigger is not better. Um, for the first time in 15 years, bigger is not better. People are overpaying because of Grant Cardone, uh, the ability to syndicate bigger deals. People are just flat out overpaying. And I have the numbers to prove it, right? Do the math. So that's, again, what I teach is I have a spreadsheet. I call it the yield calculator. I turn every asset into a bond. How much cash does it take out of my bank account to purchase? And that's down payment, closing costs, and make ready, if any. And then what's the expected yearly cash flow once the asset is stabilized? And I try to produce something greater than 6%. And the beauty about having this simple calculation is I can compare a condo with a vacation rental, with an apartment building, with a fourplex, where's a dentist office. It doesn't matter. Wow. People always ask me, what's the best choice? I say, put it in the spreadsheet, right? So that's what I mean by finding deals. I'm here to tell you today, multifamily is overpriced. There's absolutely no question in my mind. And there are, there are syndicators, there are limited partners that are going to lose money in five years because the, the assets, you, managing a C-class apartment building is hard. And yeah, you can call it value add all you want, yep. but when you overpay like it's a class A, you are, you are eventually going to pay for that. So um, that's my rant on, on syndication today. But yep. in the end, do the math. Right? I teach you how to calculate yield. I think everything's a bond. And I have to take, and, and again, I don't count appreciation. I don't count tax advantage. I don't create a mortgage pay down. It's how much cash comes out of my account for the asset. And then how much do I expect to put in once the asset is seasoned into my account? That's it. Right? And that produces a yield. So that's what yeah. I did. Well, okay. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you kind of touched on it. Like I know you don't factor that in, but I'm assuming that there are some tax benefits that are achievable through real estate investing. Was that, you know, have you received a great benefit there or, or, saw, or see a, a huge advantage from a yeah. financial perspective there? Well, again, so A, I don't calculate any of that into my purchase, right? But in reality, but now you step back and go, in reality, yeah, there are some, but realize as a high income earner, you may not appreciate some of them. Uh, I believe it's still there. Uh, 250K limit for uh, write-offs, right? Oh. If you have, if you earn more than that, they kind of remove those limitations for you. So I have a carry forward loss of over a million dollars um, that I've accumulated over 15 years um, that you only can use once the asset is sold. So while you're working and your full-time job is a salesperson, you're probably not going to get a lot of them. That said, you'll never have to pay taxes on your cash flow, right? Which is a good thing because you'll be able to take that to zero, yeah. right? Because you'll have depreciation that'll, that'll hide the cash flow in the beginning. So you won't pay taxes on your positive cash flow, uh, at least in most cases, uh, in like most, most cases. Um, but you can do a 1031 exchange, which is a huge benefit, right? While, while I was working, uh, I hit, I hinted on it earlier and it's a big part of our book. We talked about buying seven houses from like Oh three to Oh eight. And then we couldn't buy the next house because it was overpriced. Think San Francisco, right? Just crazy. Yeah. just doesn't make sense. So we did what's called a 1031 like kind exchange. So we sold a house, bought an apartment, sold a house, bought an apartment, uh, technically did an exchange. So it's not really a sale. Uh, but yeah, that was a huge benefit. Basically we took all of our profit, moved it into apartment building and didn't pay the IRS a penny. Uh, now that we're retired, right, and we have no W-2 job, we do get a lot more tax benefits uh, today. Uh, but yeah. don't calculate that while you're working because um, it just, it's just not important. You're trying to, you're trying to stack bricks. Got it. Now, you know, with that being said, I know there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of uh, folks that are involved um, when you're in the home buying process, right? <laughs> 
Um, you know, can you talk about how important it is to have the right team behind you? Yeah, again, so I don't, actually, I don't think I said it on this video. So the other thing that's important about our story is we chose to invest in a market that was two and a half hours away by car. Wow. Right. So uh, for us, the most important piece was property manager. Uh, and I wish I could tell you that was easy. We fired the first five we had uh, oh because they either lied or didn't meet service or changed how they treated us. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Uh, but yeah. if you're going to be a buy and hold landlord who's in Asia one week and South America the next week, property manager is your number one thing. Uh, from there, you can go to real estate agents or uh, uh, brokers, right? Mortgage brokers. Uh, yeah. You know, there are people that will come and go. Uh, but as a buy and hold landlord who doesn't self-manage, there is without question the anchor person for you is your property manager. So how did you go about that? Was it like, so if you were to you know, give someone like myself advice on choosing the right property manager, what are some of the key things you're looking for? Um, you know, when you analyze a company, is it, you know, it, it, yeah, I think that's my main question. Yeah. So the big thing that came to me, and this is only in self-reflection, because again, I fired the first five. So clearly yeah. I was terrible at it in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> but when I look at the one that worked versus the others that didn't, I want to find a principal, meaning the owner, I want to see, are they a real estate investor? The, some of the ones that I had to fire, they were real estate agents or real estate brokers. And yeah, and they looked at property management as a way to pay the bills, right? Keep the lights on, maybe be lead generation for their day job. And what happened to us is a couple of them did great service, but then the, the crash happened and suddenly they were REO agents and short sales specialists and all these other things. And property management went out the window because they were just doing transactions, just bang, 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 bang. So I'll never recommend uh, a property management firm where the owner is not an investor. And to be clear, I don't mean they own their home, right? I want them to be a landlord. Now, they don't need to be huge, but they should own five or eight or 10 units in their market. Or I don't want to play because that, because that just tells you how they're going to run their shop, in my opinion, right? They think like an investor. Absolutely. And, and taking it a step further, you know, when, when thinking about management expenses, you know, what percentage, um, you know, would you anticipate, you know, of your profits going towards a property management company to you think is fair or yeah, you know, I, again, I, uh, so I've paid anywhere from 10% in the beginning. And again, for me, it just, it just had to work because I, I was not going to self manage from two and a half hours yeah. away. So I paid as high as 10%. I pay nowhere, nowhere near that today because I have a decent sized portfolio. Uh, so when you hit size, you get um, discounts for sure. Uh, but I, I would tell you, um, you know, if somebody was going to charge me 12%, but they had the infrastructure and all of that, and I was just starting out, just work it into your equation. Like I talked about, it's your down payment, closing costs, and make ready. And then part of your monthly cash flow is how much the property manager is taking. Uh, I would certainly ask, don't make it about price. Uh, that's the biggest mistake I've seen is, oh, one guy charged me 10, one charged me eight. They're all the same. No, they're not all the same. Right? They're not all the same. Uh, I would make that the last question I would ask. I would actually talk about, well, how do you take care of your, how do you take care of tenants? Most people go, well, this is our eviction process and we post a three day notice and then we do this and here's our attorney. Well, great. The laws are pretty clear on how to get rid of a bad tenant. I actually want to know the other side. How do you take care of your good tenants, right? If somebody's paid rent 12 months in a row on time, in my opinion, they deserve to be rewarded because I want them to stay. The magic of this business is keeping good tenants longer because if they stay an extra year because you gave them uh, a, a new paint, uh, you painted a wall for them or you replaced it, I don't know, whatever, right? Just these little yeah. things uh, can keep good tenants. And oh, by the way, good tenants that get gifts from the landlord tell their other good tenants. <laughs> and and you just it just becomes a better environment. So uh, I like to see property managers that talk about how to take care of good tenants. The bad tenants are easy. There's a law, right? There's there's a documented process that everybody can look up. So don't yeah. don't prove to me you can repeat that. But but tell me about the good tenants. That makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, talk to me about the the, the decision to invest uh, two and a half hours away from where you were um, and that will allude into my uh, my follow-up question is like identifying you know what are some of the, the hottest markets right now um, to invest in based on your you know your opinion 
Yeah. So uh, the first answer is we spent a year because all the books I read <coughs> said invest 30 minutes from home. And I didn't know any difference when I was 30 or 29, I guess. Um, so that's what we did. We looked every, every Sunday for 52 weeks in a row in the Bay Area. And you think it doesn't make sense today, right? It didn't make sense back then. Either. Uh -huh. So uh, I remember coming back to the kitchen table and going, oh my God, what are we going to do? This is not working. You know, because again, stocks weren't an option. And we yep. still had this vision of freedom. Um, so we pulled out a California map because we asked ourselves, do we, do we get on an airplane? Do we want to get on an airplane and go to Texas? Texas was popular back in 03. And we're like, nope, I'm already on an airplane too much. The last thing I want to do is get on another airplane to see my rentals. So airplanes are out. So then it became a car. Well, okay, where can we drive to? We pulled out a California map. And the first city of size uh, that made sense uh, was Fresno, California. And we've been there ever since. Um, it, of size is important. I want a, uh, I want a diverse uh, economy, local economy. Right? There was half a million people uh, roughly back then. Now Fresno County is about a million people, so it's growing. It's based on agriculture. It doesn't have uh, high incomes, right? You can live in Fresno for 60 grand a year, which is crazy, um, at least by yeah. Bay Area standards. Right. So uh, that, that was important to me. Uh, and again, I like to invest below the median, right? So affordable housing. And, um, you know, those are all important things to me. So well, why, why is that? If you want me to ask them, affordable, and that leads me to a fun of fuller question, like affordable housing versus, versus like your, you know, six figure income family that you know like what's that profile and how did you get that decision yeah one quick sec i need to need to do something for my puppy real quick one sec no no worries take your time Bye. Bye. sorry that's what happens when it's live <laughs> no worries so what uh now you gotta let me know i, I just got a, a french bulldog puppy he's about six yeah. months what kind of puppy do you it's have a sh it's a shih tzu uh, okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. How old? Uh, he's 14. So yeah, yeah, he's, he's, an old, he's an old one. So back to your question. So, um, so a couple of, a couple of answers, if I'm honest with myself, first and foremost, how you grew up is becomes part of who you are. Uh, and I did not grow up in an affluent, um, environment. Right. Uh, so I was comfortable, uh, working class and, um, and I knew, um, that what, what it meant to have a safe and secure home, uh, to, to live in. So that was always important to me if I could, if I could give back in that little way. So, so yeah. that, that's kind of who I am at my core. And then what I realized over time <clears throat> is they're not building new supply at a price point that I was buying older stock at. So it just became a comfort zone and I had security, <clears throat> right? Cause if you can build a house for 300 K but I can buy an old 1950s or 60s house for 180 and they rent for roughly the same, my yield goes higher. Uh, and again, I've been doing this for 15 years. So I saw what happened to the dot-com crash. I saw what happened in the 08 crash. And um, I was far more protected with affordable housing. So what I call affordable is whatever the median is. So the median in Fresno today is like 268. So I'll buy stuff below 200. Right, because I want security in Atlanta. I don't know what it is, but let's say it's four fifty. Yeah. So I'd want to be like three seventy five and below. Um, and what happens is, if the world shakes and stuff gets crazy, the high end gets crushed because people stop buying, and then they just, you know, the the, the lower end is is better cushioned, in my opinion. Now, now one argument that I've heard against the potentially portable housing uh, in, in this, you know. Hope this didn't come off the wrong way, but uh, just in terms of like managing tenants and, yeah. and how the hassle and you know and typically historically folks that have dealt with you know low income or affordable housing, they feel maybe the experience dealing with tenants might not have been the same with dealing with some of the affluent. Yeah. You know, well, so that's that's um, that is interesting. How the, uh, well, I guess I call it the telephone game goes right. Well, people tell people other stories and all of that. And again, bad news spreads better than good news. But here's the reality. I've had thousands of tenants and I only have affordable housing. I, um, if you're on the Monopoly board, right, you know the Monopoly board, right? Dark purple, light blue, I forget, orange, I think. Yeah. yeah orange and then red. Like I'm light blue and orange, right? That's where I am on the Monopoly board. Just so everybody sees where I'm at. 
I don't have purple, right? So not the Baltic and Mediterranean or whatever it is, but light blue and orange. I, I think orange is the next color. <clears throat> so that's me. But here's the reality. Of the thousands of tenants I've had, 98% of them are hardworking families that want to pay, that pay their rent and do good stuff. 1% of them, you have to remind them that they owe you rent. For whatever reason, they forget that the first comes around and you need to remind them. And then the other 1% are what I call professional tenants that are looking to purposely hurt and inflict pain on the landlord through evictions. And, you know, it's just, it happens, right? Unfortunately, that 1% is what everybody talks about. And again, I have had thousands of tenants and yes, they are out there and I have all the stories if you want to talk about them. Yep. But 98% of my tenants are just like my family growing up. Somebody's going to work, they're saving as much as they can, they're living paycheck to paycheck, but the rent's getting paid. And um, that's, that's the reality. Um, now, let's talk about what happens in the crash, right? What happened in the crash? My tenants, um, they live paycheck to paycheck, most of them. So yes, when the crash happened and the unemployment spiked, some of them had to double up. Some people went from houses to apartments, which is something you can plan for, you budget for. Uh, it happened in greater numbers because of the crash was so hard. But what people don't realize is the people who have savings, those are the ones that can hire attorneys. Those are the ones that know about bankruptcy law. Those are the people, right? Look what happened in judici judicial states like New York and Florida. Some people were holding on for three, four, five years um, to get them out, right? To foreclose on their houses. So um, I would tell you that's a pretty common story, a misnomer. Uh, I would, I, again, it's who I am. I've been pretty clear about this. Uh, I'm not going anywhere else. I'm going to be in the light blue and, and orange for, for the rest of my investing. Uh, and I'm okay with that. I don't want Park Place or Boardwalk or Marvin Gardens. Um, I think those are horrible returns. I think those are status symbols you want to tell your family about. But at the end of the day, I don't, you, can't, you can't write your visa and say, hey, I own you know, Park Place. Take care of me. <laughs> right? I, sp I spend the money that comes into my bank account. Got it. And going back to the decision to, I guess, invest in, in Fresno, you know, for me, I'm here in Atlanta. Um, Atlanta is a, a booming market. Um, there, there's lots of, you know, folks that are moving, building. It's, it's a growing city, right? It's been growing for years. It's, one would say it's almost too saturated at this point, right? Um, so with that comes lots of investments, lots of investment firms looking to um, take advantage of, you know, the, the inflation of, you know, population of growth and jobs, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I, find, where, you know, where, what market should I be looking at? You know, where should I be looking for the best deals? You know, I'm hearing, you know, Orlando, I'm hearing the Carolinas, I'm hearing the sub markets like Alabama. Like, how do I decide on the best market for me at this point in time? Uh, again, this goes back to the shiny object problem, just a different answer or a different version of the same question. Just like there's different assets and the different ways to go, the question shouldn't be how do I, or what's the hot market? Because by the time it is a hot market, it's too late. Uh, what you need to be thinking about is you need to build a new skill. And you can build that skill in Atlanta. You need to be able to pick a skill about how do I understand what my market produces? And this is 100% step one of my courses. I want to just pick Atlanta. I want to go look at three bedroom, two bath homes, and this zip code between this size and this size. You need to look at that subset every day for 90 days. And what you're going to come out of that is you're going to start to understand how the market ebbs and flows. And then when you take that data, you put it in my yield calculation, you're going to answer the most important question. What does my market produce? And let's just make stuff up. Let's say that Atlanta produces a 5% return. This is what you've just done. You have created a baseline for Atlanta. But more importantly, you have learned how to discover a market. So what, why, is that, why is understanding the average deal important? Because what I think is, is 99% of the stuff on the market is a bad or average deal. But most new investors, yourself included, don't know that because you look at the 375 listings and you go, oh my God, I want the yellow house or the blue house or whatever. No, learn the market, put in the yield spreadsheet, figure out what an average deal is. And then after you've done that homework, you go, okay, great. I'm only going to work on good or great deals. And if five is the baseline, maybe 6% is a good deal and 8% is a great deal. 
But after you do that, and I didn't know about this until I went back and documented our story. That's what we did in Fresno. I looked every day for 10 years. And I started in a really, really small zip code and asset type and then built over time. I still use the same spreadsheet today. But now, my, now I can look at all of Fresno County and go, okay, well, this and that and, and, and all these other variables. But once you learn that skill and you could do it in your backyard, you could take it to South Carolina. You could take it to Knoxville, Tennessee. You could take it to Huntsville, Alabama. The question isn't what market. The question is, have I learned the skill to learn a market? And most people don't start there. And that's the huge mistake. And that's why they walk up to the roulette table and they go, I'm going to take 18. Well, how do you know 18? No, you should go in and understand your market, figure out what an average deal is, and then only work on good and great. Uh, and that's what I'm spending a lion's share of my time trying to teach people to do. One of my deals. Got it. Um, now, I guess another question is, when is, is now a good time to invest? I think now is the best time to learn that skill. Uh, if you read our book and our story, there were two times when we were, quote unquote, out of the market. Uh, one was right after Bear Stearns collapsed because that was frightening, right? It would never happen before. Wall Street firm was out of business, was in business one day, out of business the next day. So like everybody else, we stopped, but we stayed in the market. And then we wrote it all the way down. We were buying, right? We never knew where the bottom was. So we kept buying. And then one day, I remember because we were in the market every day, suddenly there were no more short sales or no new REOs. And we're like, what's, what's going on? We've been doing this for five years. They're always there. And it turns out that uh, some large hedge funds came in and bought everything sight unseen because wow. prices got so low. So again, we're like, whoa, that's different. Let's take a pause. So I think today we are at a peak and it could be turning over. But you don't wait to learn your skill until the definition of the turnover is there. This is a pause period. It could go higher, sure, but it also could go lower. That doesn't matter to you. Go spend 90 days and learn the skill that I'm trying to teach you. Now's the perfect time because we don't know where the economy is going. Unemployment could spike. Interest rates could be this. Stock market could collapse. Who cares? Your job is to learn the skill. And that is what is a bad, average, good, and great deal. Now's the time. Now, I'm hearing, you know, this, you know, interest rates and a recession. Like, you know, what are your thoughts on this whole, you know, idea of, you know, we're running into a recession or are we already in a recession? And you know, mm -hmm. interest rates are the lowest that we've been, they've been in decades. What does that mean for the so individual? Think, yeah, so a, a, new la a new landlord should be, a new acquisition person should be, ridiculously excited about low interest rates. I was buying properties when interest rates were in the sevens. Wow. I just met a guy yesterday that got a two and a half percent interest rate. So go get the cheapest 30 year money you can and you will look like a genius in five years because interest rates can't be this low forever. So go get 30 year money cheap and you'll, it's like printing money, right? Inflation is probably one and a half percent. So really, what are you paying? One percent? I mean, it's crazy. So first off, now's the time to take cash as trash, buy assets that produce income. Because what are you going to earn in a bank? You're going you're to earn essentially negative interest rates pretty soon. Uh, and then as far as recession is coming, yeah, I, in the last week or so, I'm pretty convinced uh, we are heading into a, a recession for sure. Um, negative news, headlines. But again, this is the time to learn your market because when a recession occurs, lots of people that are in your shoes, uh, Charles, are, are going to be like, I'm scared. I don't want to buy. What's the problem today? There are too many buyers. That's about to go away. So your spread on a good or great deal is about to get bigger. In our example, it was 1% from average to good and 2% from average to great. In the future, you know, it might be 3%, yeah. but you have to learn your skill. And I think, I think changing markets, uh, I think the herd, that's why the problem with syndication is anytime the herd goes one direction, I am going an entirely different direction um, wow. because I've seen the herd get hurt and it's going to happen again. Now, there's a couple of two pieces there. So well, I've seen a big, you know, syndication, um, you know, REITs, real estate investment funds, real estate investment trusts. Uh -huh. Are they a better investment for someone looking to get into the real estate market? Uh, what are some of the pros and cons versus going, you know, 
getting a part, being a part of a fund versus mm -hmm. investing directly into real estate? Um, so again, you have to know my lens. Uh, again, I don't think I've said it on this show. Uh, I, I own, I, my wife and I own all our stuff, right? We're not, it's our, it's our companies, our LLCs, right? So uh, we don't, we've never partnered with anyone. We've never done a syndication. Uh, we frankly never would because we're kind of control freaks. Mm -hmm. um, this is who we are. But I think, um, I think being a limited partner in a new syndication today is going to be just as bad as the real estate collapse in 08. Uh, and I say that because asset prices are at price for perfection. We are going to go into an economy that forces people to have higher than expected um, turnover, evictions, right? When unemployment goes from four to 8%, all of these apartment buildings that are running at 98% occupancy won't be. And people are going to lose their ass. It's going to be terrible. Uh, so that's, that's my thoughts there. The second thing is, is um, I don't, I hate the whole bigger is better thing and go invest with me and trust me and all of that. I hate the trust me kind of thing. It's, um, it just grades on me. I, I'd rather do my own homework and then live or die by my decisions. Um, I think there's frankly going to be a lot of syndicators that go to jail because what they're going to be doing is raising funds over and over. And what's going to happen is they're going to turn into Ponzi schemes because they promised 6% on investment two, and they took from investment three to pay investment two. And um, it's going to be sad. There, there, will be, there will be people that go to jail because they were good people and they meant well. But here first. Yeah, it's going to be bad. Yeah. No, no worries. So, so on that note, uh, when it when it comes to um, financing a deal, right? Mm -hmm. Financing your first piece of investment property. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had mentioned it earlier. Thirty year. Yeah. Uh, what options do I have as a first time investor in financing my first investment property? Yeah. So again, right. So first and foremost, if, if you're 30 or 32, like I was in the beginning, you are now, um, go get 30 year money. It's the cheapest money you'll probably ever get for 30 years. I talked to some other people that are saying, Hey, I'm in my fifties and just starting out. Now, if you can, and you have the extra cash for them, I'm telling them 15 years, right? Because they want to be, when they're close to being done, they want the assets free and clear. So that's a decision you have to take. Uh, I would never get an adjustable rate mortgage, especially when rates are so low. It's silly. Oh, I can get a 7-1 arm at 1.9. Well, you can go get a 30-year fixed at 2.9. Who cares, right? I mean, come on. Why would you want that interest rate risk? Today, the rates are so low, you should not take interest rate risk. Uh, and I would not look at anything except a 30 or a 15-year based on where you are in your lifespan. Um, I mean, there are lots of other options. I would not, I would not let some financial mortgage broker talk me into anything else except a 30 year or a 15 year mortgage based on how old you are. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Now, can you talk to me? What, what is PMI? What, what, what is that? Private mortgage insurance, I think is what you're referring to. Basically, if you have anything less than 20% down, um, the person giving you the mortgage wants insurance in case you default. So they, uh, so yeah. you, you pay a little extra for that. Is that required in, in all instances or like, do you always need PMI or? Uh, that, ask your lenders. Yeah, I would, most mortgage brokers are going to face that. Sorry, my dog's barking again. One second. <laughs> no Why do you come in and then you go out? You silly puppy. Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, okay, so PMI, that's required when, you know, you, you, I guess you don't have the 20% down. Yeah, like, yeah, I did a bunch of what was called 90 10 tens back in the day. 90% or 80% first, I'm sorry, 80 10 tens. 80% first, 10% second, 10% down. Because yeah. I had the, um, the two loans separate, I actually avoided PMI. I don't know if that works today, but back in 03, 04, that worked. Um, because the first mortgage only had 80%, so you avoided the PMI. Uh, that wow. may work today, I, I don't know. Seriously, so I haven't got a mortgage like that in a while. No, no worries. Now, in, in, ter in terms of loan options, um, you know, there's the FHA home loans, right? You've got your conventional, yep, loans, right? Yep. 
First time buyer. First time buyer, you should walk into whoever has your checking and savings account and say, hey, I want to buy, I want to get an investment loan. The first four are ridiculously easy. They're all sold to FHA, uh, lease documentation, lowest interest rates. Don't overthink it. When you get to loan five through 10, maybe shop around, get a mortgage broker, but one through four, don't overthink it. If your bank's Wells Fargo, go to Wells Fargo. If your bank's Bank of America, go to Bank of... Your, if your bank's a credit union, go to the credit union. Um, yeah, don't overthink it. And so you're saying the FHA is the way to go, hands down. Okay. Well, I think what you're saying with FHA is an owner-occupant, I think is what you're saying, right? You can get an FHA loan 3.5% down, but you're not going to get that for an investment loan. The gov so if you get an investment loan, the government will still buy it, Yep. But I think what you're referring to when you say FHA is the whole three and a half percent down, that's only for owner occupants. It's only for owner occupants, right? Yes. Okay. So in that case, you then want to be looking for a multifamily home or multi-unit in which you can pitch them up the room or... Yeah, there are people that do the fourplexes because that's the largest unit count you can get on a residential and they house hack, right? They go, hey, I'm going to live in one and rent out the other three. That's kind of why fourplexes have taken off uh, in yep. discussions. Got it. Now, theoretically speaking, um, you know, if, if you're in my shoes, uh, theoretically speaking, let's say I have $40,000 cash right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, I, you know, I'm, I'm in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I, I see oper there are opportunity funds. There's, there's opportunity zones. There's multifamily units. You know, what's my play? 40K, I've got good, good credit. Yep. Good credit's good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want to start investing today. I know it begins with the research. Yeah. You, yeah. Step, so, so first off, that's exactly what we started with. So it is possible. We started with 40K. It's exactly the same number. Wow. Uh, now that was 40K in 03. So maybe it's 70K today. I don't know. But, but 40 grand is what we had. So it is possible. I would not be in a rush. You need, to, until you could look at me in the mirror and say, hey, this house is better than that house because it produces this or that, or this apartment is better than that one because this or that, I would not bless you to make an investment. Otherwise, you're gambling. You're, I, I saw people do this last cycle because they, they, I had success in Fresno, right? People kept hearing my story. I knew one guy that went down to Fresno, saw five houses, wrote three offers and bought two things. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? How do you? How do you know? Yeah. Oh, I like the layout in this one. And this one was, you know, had a big, had a nice backyard. I'm like, that's not the reason you buy stuff, right? You should have bought the best deal. Um, so I am adamant. The thing you need to do is go learn your market. And I teach you how to do that. Um, go, go spend 30 days looking at three bedroom, two bath, 1200 square foot houses in Atlanta, create a list, look at it every day, watch things come and go, then do the math. And then come back to me and go, here's my spreadsheet, right? That's where I have a private Facebook group where students send me their spreadsheet. And I go, great. Tell me about row 13 and row eight. Because now we're talking about yield. It's not about the red house or the blue house. or the, it's, it's about how much my investment produces. And sometimes people do the math wrong and they don't have the right calculations. Right. But that's it. Tell me what the average deal is for Atlanta in this area. And then let's go only look at good and great deals, Charles. Until you do that, you're gambling. You're just flat out gambling. Love it. Love it. Now, how does one get signed up? I, I'd love to start signing up for the course. I want to get access to the calculator and start focusing on my yields. Awesome. Where do I go from here? So the best way to do that, I'll put the link in the description. But Perfect. if you go to my website, onerentalatatime.com, scroll down to the course, you'll see it. I, I forget what it says, but it says $199 for the course. Pick that, and then what I'll do for everyone watching this is I have a coupon code called BOOK20, B-O-O-K-2-0. And what that will get you is you'll save 20 bucks, so you'll pay 179 and then I will mail you an autographed copy of my book that's 15 bucks on Amazon. No way. Yeah. I'm going to give some stuff away just for you. So go to the course or go to my okay. website, onerentalatetime.com. Scroll down to the course, buy now, coupon code is book20. That'll come into my email sometime today. I'll then ask for your address. Um, step one will be learning your market. Step two is the yield. And then I will mail you this wonderful book, which, oh, by the way, 
was just rated the, one of the top 10 real estate investing books. Uh, I got that note yesterday. It's number five on a top 10 list. So I was pretty, I was awesome. very, very happy with that. No way. Cool. Yeah, yesterday. I look oh. forward to it. Let, um, I, you know, Mike, I really appreciate the time. I, I feel um, in a much more comfortable knowing where to get started from here based off our conversation. And, you know, for me, looking forward to really diving into the course, looking forward to reviewing the book. Yeah. And hopefully by the end of this year, my, one of my goals are is to own my first investment property. So I'd love to maybe do a follow-up uh, awesome. session where we discuss what went what, well, what went what wrong, wrong, and, you know, some learning, uh, some learning, Absolutely. Things. I tell you what, let's, let's plan on a couple of things. So first and foremost, when you buy the course, you use the coupon code, yep. make sure you uh, join the private Facebook group. One, okay. rent, one rental at a time works. It's only for my students. So you'll okay. be around other like-minded individuals. So make sure you do that. And then what we'll do uh, after you go through the course, we'll have another one of these just to get your feedback. I've done a couple of interviews with other yeah. students, which has been awesome. And then, yeah, dude, we interact on the course, put out your spreadsheet. Let's every students are helping students now. It's pretty fun to watch. Wow. So, How big is the uh, network or student or I, you, you I have just under 150 students. I think about half of them are in the Facebook group. Well, wow. and, and it's pretty active. Still, you're yeah, still every day. I, that, if you want to get a hold of me, the best way to do it is in that private Facebook group because those are my students. Those are people I feel like I owe. Um, otherwise, there's no guarantee. But that Facebook group I look <laughs> yeah. at every day. And is it, one, is it just a one-time fee of $199? Yep. One-time fee. I'm adding more stuff. Wow. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not, no, I don't upsell. I don't do anything else. Yeah. I am sheerly trying to, and, there, and, and, and honestly, I tried to give this away for free like a year ago, but nobody was valuing it because people don't value free. So I figured yeah. out what price point <laughs> I could recover my cost because it costs money to host and have security and all that nonsense. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, this is what I do for fun now is I try to help people get started. And it's about learning your market and having a yield calculation. And um, you should be, uh, you'll be in a much, much better position. Love it. Thanks, Mike. All right, buddy. Take care. Let me know how it goes. Have a good one. Yep. Cheers.